Hey friends, welcome back to Making Moves with Bay and Daniel. I'm Daniel, and in this interview series, we'll talk to current students and alumni from different colleges and universities in Canada to answer your top questions and programs of schools that you're interested in. Today, we're joined by Nico Kaminade. Nico, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today. Great to be here. Hi, Daniel. Hey, Nico, thank you again. You are no pressure, but you are the first guest on this podcast and on my interview series <laughs> so thank you so much for doing this um yeah so nico we'll just go straight into it a lot of our uh, viewers really want to know more about you know certain programs in certain schools and that's why we invited you here uh we'll get right into it first question nico what school did you go to and what was your program um so currently i'm in Centennial college so in the progress campus and I'm taking up um, supply chain and business operations. Yeah. Nice. And how many years is this program? So um, that program, it has two different variations. There's a two-year and a three-year program. And the one that I'm in is a two-year program. And the, I think the main difference within the three-year is that they have a co-op option and they have the break, which is mine is like more of a fast track so that we can just like start into the school and just finish and get a job right just go just go straight into into working i like it and uh what type of program is it is it like post-secondary masters i think they have it classified as sort of a diploma program um so i think it falls just somewhere below a bachelor's degree but i think it's perfect for those who already have a degree completed Got it. And what was the supply chain management? It's very interesting. What's the main reason that you chose this program, Nico? Um, so it's more of it ties into something that I've always wanted to do, which is something that's working into the UN, um, more on the supply and logistics side. And uh, so I did a little background on myself. I did business in the Philippines and I did flying in the US. So Using supply chain and tying everything together, it sort of um, builds a certain foundation that I can use into like future careers. So it's sort of the last piece in my puzzle to complete that like goal. I love that. And uh, what was the admission process like? Like, how was the whole experience from like, you know, you were in the Philippines and you tried to apply for this? Can you tell us more about the process? Yeah, so I think more of the it's sort of just applying to the school itself. Um, so uh, most schools in Canada, they request for IELTS or some sort of English proficiency test. But Centennial is one of those schools that doesn't need it. Um, so you can just apply, you send them your, I think, your high school and your college credentials, then a few paperworks, and then choosing your program and as well as paying the deposit. And afterwards, Centennial just sends you the offer letter. So basically, super simple and straightforward. Yeah. How, how was how many months did you plan that out? Was that like like I don't know, two years, one year? How how was the timeline from the moment you decided that okay, I'm gonna apply to Centennial College? What was the timeline like? Um, just applying from Centennial College is more of like less than three months. So since you know how spots fill up in schools pretty fast, it's the same for every school in Canada. So once you've decided on what you want to take or what program you want to take, just start applying to every school you see because the spot they really fill up very fast. I think last time I checked with Centennial, the my supply program for supply chain, it's already full for the fall semester, which is around August, September of this year. Wow. And do you remember like the timeline of your student visa like processing from the time you applied how long did that take i think it's about it was roughly about two months so i i applied in the march and it came out first week of june yo that is so fast yeah it was before um all of the ircc delays yeah huh amazing yeah no that's super fast i remember bay and i it took us like i don't know man, like five six months and some people take like a year so two months is like lightning fast i'm so happy for you that's awesome um and how much was the tuition fee and other expenses associated with studying at centennial college 
Yeah, so the tuition fee is broken down to four semesters. So you pay usually two to three months before each semester starts. And it's roughly about 8,000 to 9,000 Canadian dollars per semester. So usually the last semester, that's where the bulk of the tuition fee goes, roughly about 9,000 because they cover, um, I think all of the closing fees. And then um, so much it's, uh, so initially when you apply, you pay the deposit, and then afterwards, once you get accepted, you pay the additional tuition fee, and so on and so forth. As for additional expenses, um, you usually, like in addition to the classes that you take, that you pay for already, you pay for um, books, as well as for some like additional platforms that you have to use to use that class. So it's roughly about 200 to 500 per semester, additionally. Mm, like, it depends on the professor. Okay. And are books required or how does that work? Yeah. So books being required is more of depending on the professor and if they use a platform. So what some professors do is they use a platform that has the book already. But you don't need the book exactly. You need the platform to take quizzes and assignments. Hmm. Gotcha. Right. So so you like you have to pay, let's say for a certain subject, you have to pay, let's say, two hundred or three hundred dollars just to access, you know, the online tools that you need to pass the course. Yeah. So I wouldn't actually recommend that you buy books just because you want to read the book. Um, because books are expensive here. Um, I think the cheapest book that you can get is about seventy dollars. And then you're not gonna be using it after that semester, right? I mean practically speaking yeah i'm smiling so much because i remember guys there was uh so i was in marketing there was a prof who told us to buy this like 300 dollar book he said it was required and then me being a new student here i was like oh it's required let's buy it we ended up using that book once for like 10 minutes and I was like, oh my gosh, I just wasted my money. Um, so quick tip, if if your professors require you to buy a book, just make sure it's really required for you like to pass because we don't want to waste like 300 bucks here. Um, and how many courses do you typically take in a semester? Uh, what does your schedule look like? Um, so for some, first semester, it's usually six to seven subjects. It depends on you, actually. So for the first semester, you're required to take what does college gives you to take. But for the remaining semesters, you're free um, according to your budget and your time to take more and more classes. So right now I'm taking seven, um, just so that it gets done faster. Um, yeah, but the schedule is pretty light. Now it's the summer semester. Usually the summer semester is where most students take their breaks or that's where most professors take their sabbatical. Um, so right now, I only come to school twice a week, and uh, a lot of my classes are asynchronous, which is, um, it's a very sweet type of class. Right, so so this seven subjects, that's a lot. So seven subjects, how many subjects do you take in person right now? Uh, I think three, yeah, three. Three, and these are like, what days? Uh, that's two on the Mondays, and then one is on the Thursday. Okay. And how long are these in-person classes? It's usually three hours each. Three hours. Okay. Is there like a break in those three hours, or like it's just straight three hours of studying? So that depends on the professor as well. So some of them use the entire three hours, some of them just like breeze through the content and then just let, it, let you go. Right. And then the, the asynchronous ones, the online ones, I'm assuming there's no like, uh, are there like hours associated with those, or is it like, hey, read this book and then just answer the homework? Uh, yeah, so they used to have like two different types. So there's an online one and a synchronous. But the online one is there's an, an actual time that you have to go to and listen to the professor. But the asynchronous ones, the one right now, it's all on you. Like they give you the content, everything, and it's up to you to answer everything. Wow. You, you said that was bittersweet. Why? Because um, like some viewers will say, well, you basically just answer it whenever you want. That sounds easy. Why, why did you say it was bittersweet? Yeah, but it depends on like what the class is. So if, for example, a class is something that you really want to learn, learn something at, like something that you want to specialize in or something that you 
you actually don't know anything about, it's hard because you're not getting any lecturing, anything. It's just you studying. And if you don't have any like self-discipline in studying, deadlines are gonna just slam at you. Mm, right. No, that that's true. Cause I remember when because when Bea and I were studying, it was like the height of COVID. And then it just went asynchronous. We literally did not have that self-discipline to study at home and put in the hours. It, it was tough. How are you handling that? Are you the type of student who like, whatever happens, I'll put my all into this, I'll learn this? Or like, is there quite a struggle in that end? Uh, I usually try to um, accomplish like any task that I have to do roughly about a week or a few days before it's due. Just so that I know I have time to um, cram it later on. Because I know that if I have it in my calendar, let's say Monday, and it's on a Friday, I'm going to end up doing it on my steel that Thursday. Mm. Right. No, that, that, that's a good tip. Um, and Nico, can you provide a short review of the coursework, like such as assignments, exams, quizzes? Like, were they difficult? Just any information you can share? Yeah. So. With the coursework, uh, you have something you have to expect is that um, Canadian schools like their homeworks, like their assignments. So there, there's a lot of papers, there's a lot of mini quizzes, mini quizzes that you have to take. That's something that um, must be done by them. Actually, a lot of uh, classes right now are transitioning back to in-person exams. So before it used to be just online, but right now they're making us do um, in-person exams again. If you have a laptop, it's pretty helpful to just keep yourself organized since most classes just do their exams in the laptops. You just have to bring them into school. Yeah. So then for quizzes, assignments, um, a lot of it's group work, especially if you're in a business program. Choosing group groupmates well is something very, very important. Most uh, professors, they allow you to um, just group with friends. Make sure that you're group with friends that are, you know, like different habits in life. Because if all of you are crammers, it's gonna end up like a problem in the end. <laughs> no, I know exactly what you mean. Let, let's go to a uh, let's go to group works. Um, because again, guys, if you're listening to this episode and you still haven't, you know, you're just about to to enter a college here in Canada, there are some profs like what Nico said. There are some profs who will let you choose their groupmates. But Nico, there's also a lot of profs who are like, no, we'll do random groupings because in the workforce, you can't choose your workmates. And I see you smiling because I know you know that's tough. Like, that is tough. Like, you will be paired with some groupmates who don't even show up until like the last moment. Uh, Nico, any success tips for group works where it's like random and they're not your friends, they're just like random people you've never met? Uh, just try to keep it light as possible because even if, say, you're a great conscious person, I'm talking to all of the great conscious people, you have to understand that majority of the students here in Canada, they're working a job, two jobs, three jobs, and it's, sometimes it's hard to balance everything out. A lot of them are working night shifts, working retail, so you have to understand and be flexible when giving deadlines, more of like understanding the person that are sometimes struggling with making the financial goals of the school. So if you think of it, look at it that way, but as well as not entertain any freeloaders, you're going to be fine. But you have to know where to put your foot down when it comes to freeloading. That's the question. That was the most like professional way of someone to ever tell me to be like... <laughs> Don't mind them, just do your thing. That, that was really well put. Um, and Nico, how would you describe the, the campus culture of Centennial College? Like, what's the culture like? Did you feel like it was supportive and inclusive of international students? It's pretty, uh, it's pretty inclusive. Um, majority, probably 90% or more of the students on campus are international students. So you're pretty welcome. A lot of it's um, Filipinos. Uh, majority are Filipinos, Indians, and Chinese students. I think that's where the majority of the, the people are from. But yep, yeah, everyone's been nice. I haven't encountered any, like anything bad. Uh, but 
I think it inclusive um, there's a lot of programs that if you're very active, a lot of organizations and a lot of groups that you can uh, support people. That's a good idea. That's awesome. And does the program allow international students to apply for a postgraduate work permit? How does that work? Yeah, so um, I think how they have it. So this isn't legal advice or anything, but from a two-year program, I think you're about to get like two to three years of postgraduate work permit. So I think that's pretty good. It gives you a lot of time and a lot of options to um, find your way in the workforce. Fantastic. And how long was the program, uh, supply chain management? How long is it? Do you have any official breaks in between semesters or terms? Uh, I know you touched on this earlier, but do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, so they have it advertised as two years, but it's actually just 18 months since you take out three semesters in a year and then another one after that. So about three or four months after. So you knock it out in like less than 18 months, 16 months probably. There's no break. So you have to be ready um, academically and financially. Gotcha. And were there any scholarships or financial aid options available for international students that you know of? Um, I think there's one that one that you have to prove that you, you need the financial assistance to, in order to do it. But I think that's not, again, this is really good advice, but I think it's frowned upon. If your goal is to become a PR or eventually move into Canada, because um, the assumption is that you're going to Canada to study and you have the financial means to back yourself up for at least a year and a half. Gotcha. And let's talk about, let's go back to your subjects or courses. Was there any favorite course that you took in the program and why was it your favorite? I think one of my favorite and most memorable ones for the marketing classes that these you have. So I had that uh, one with Bea. So it was something that professor was really, um, he was different in terms of how different professors teach. And he approached the way he teach, he taught us differently. And I think other than that is um, anything that's related to supply chain in my classes. So yeah, I know that it's like getting deep into how the logistics side of every company works. And it's really good. Uh, you learn a lot from actual professionals that have experience in the field not just like teaching ever since they got out of college. Nice. And what was the most challenging course that you took and why? Um, I think it's probably one I have right now. What is it? Um, it's, um, it's an SAT course. So it's a peer program course. And um, it's something that's very used in the industry. But you cannot believe it. Like, it's not that the material, the material is already hard as it is, but I think the way it's being taught, mm. yeah, that's pretty much it. Is it like asynchronous or in person? No, it's in person. Oh, rough. A procurement? Is that what you said? Yeah, it's, a, it's an SAP, like a procurement course. Yeah. So, yeah. Ooh, rough. I mean, there's something wrong with the professor. I have to backpedal a little bit because, you know, <laughs> I think this is going live and if someone might see it, but it's not something wrong. A lot of people will see it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you were saying? It's not something bad with the professor. It's not about him. I think it's just how the course was structured around um, the entire thing itself. Right, right. No, that, that's so true. And what were you doing? So it, it's a challenge, right? Do you do anything, uh, you know, to make it easier? Like maybe you chat with a prof and like after hours, I don't know. Were you, how, are you, how are you coping? with a super tough subject? Uh, I think for that, you just have to reach out by yourself. Like, look for people who get the material. Just talk to them, like, ask for help. A lot of Filipinos in the, in the program, they're very helpful. So um, everyone's just sharing their notes, their knowledge. And um, yeah, there's a lot of material online in YouTube, but you can use that if you're like, into self-studying. But if not, um, there's a lot of material and resources online as well. You can always reach out to your professor as well, like through email. Yeah. For sure. And Nico, what did you like about the supply management program? Like, I'll, I'll rephrase that. What, yeah. I mean, what did you most like about the program? What do you love about it? Um, so it's basically just seeing the, like how 
something that you ordered from, let's see, um, from Amazon or like from China to get to you into your doorstep, like how it, how everything builds into that product and how it gets to you. So seeing that, like from my courses, um, it's amazing that you realize like how many moving parts to take for you to get that item at like 99 cents or like a dollar. Hmm. No, oh, super interesting. And how about what do you most dislike about the program? The assignments. The assignments? Yeah. Why? Um, so it's a lot. It's really, really a lot. And if you, like, imagine seven courses getting around 10 to 15 assignments each. Per? Uh, like, per subject. Is that per month? How does that work? No, like, for the entire semester. So that's, like, seven times 15. That's, that's a lot. Then you still have places. You have to go to classes. You have to work. You have to live a life. Like, summer here, you have to go outside. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it's a lot. Oh, that's a lot. Uh, since we're on this topic, how any tips for anyone who's experienced, who's about to experience that? We're talking like so many assignments. And again, you have a job, you need to live a life. What are your tips in getting these done? Um, the goal here is for you to pass. You don't have to get a perfect or an A+. Plus. I mean, it's great to have one, but you don't have to dedicate yourself entirely into that grade if you accomplish it you finish it and you get like a passing mark so a passing mark here is 50 over 100 it's not a lot you can do it so don't stress too much about the studies because you know there's a lot more in canada that you can offer you can do but yeah as long as you pass that's right i love that no that's that's a super good point if any one of you is watching from the philippines i think we got used to Nico, correct me if I'm wrong. When we were in the Philippines, it's like a 75% passing rate. Now that I think about it, man, that is a lot. I'm like, how did we survive? But here it's like 50%. So, so a, 70, a 75 in Sydney is already a B. Mm. Yeah, so it's a, like you get an 80, you're already an A. So you're right. fine. You're fine. That's true. Uh, Nico, do you have any tips? uh for success for those who are considering taking the supply management program at centennial based on your experiences and insights um, it's ideal to get the fundamentals fundamentals down um so like the concepts you have to understand it um read up on like news canadian and international and then um if you're a profession uh, proficient in excel and like other data related um like applications use that it's something that very important you have classes regarding excel and data it makes life easier faster um yeah pretty much it awesome and do you feel like your program helped you get a job in canada i think it helped because like i'm working in a warehouse so i think supply chain like they were really looking into that field but it's not a lot because even if you have like Tons of experience in the Philippines or anywhere abroad. But even if uh, I know a lot of people who work in like Dubai or US, when they came here, they work in detail. So it's you have to accept that you have to work the odd jobs. Right now, like you're still working part time. Mm. And what's your current job now? You're you're in the warehouse, right? Yeah, I work warehouse as fulfillment. Fulfillment. Okay. And that's very cool. How how do you get that job while studying? Um, so when I got here, I was really under like the pressure to find a job because I didn't want to use all my free time just to climb around. So I just sent out like maybe five, ten applications a day in Indeed. So I used Indeed, um, yeah, LinkedIn, even Facebook if you're, but be careful on Facebook, there's a lot of scams, but Indeed and LinkedIn, they're very good um, for applying jobs. Just fix up your resume, fix it to the Canadian format to send out every job that you see that you're interested in. And that's ideally that's near to your place because it's a big factor. Mm. Well, how was the process like? Let's say, did, did you just get a call out of nowhere for an interview? Did you get an email saying, hey, go to our office, we'd like to interview in person? How that, how'd that work? 
Yeah, so I think the main difference from working in the Philippines and here is that they do a lot of assessments. So after you submit your resume like online, they're gonna send you like an assessment link that you have to take. So it's like an exam to test like basic skills. Once you pass that, you usually get a like either a phone or a call or a video call interview. And then once they like you, they get you into a working interview. So that's where you come in, you talk to the manager, the hiring manager, and either they just talk to you for like a few minutes, 30 minutes, or they make you do something that's related to the job that you're about to do. And once they're going to ask you if, you if you do well, and if you like what you're doing, they'll get you an offer. Oh, that's cool. Any any tips for international students who want to get a job like that? Um, yeah, just be yourself. Like, know your skills, know what you can do. Um, and at the same time, just like come on time always because they're very, you know, it's very important here that you come on time. Mm, Filipino and, time is not, <laughs> it's not, it's not good here. <laughs> yeah. Got it. And yeah, I mean, before we, that, that was really insightful, Nico. Thank you so much. Before I go to my last question, uh, if people want to connect with you online or reach out, where where should they reach out to you? Uh, best place to reach me is through Instagram. So my handle is uh, Nico Caminade. So my first and last name, that's pretty much it. Uh, you should be responding like, within the day or the next day if I'm on the, if I'm busy. Perfect. All right. We'll link that in the notes below. And Nico, final question. What is your best success tip for anyone who wants to make it in Canada? Have fun and uh, just be ready for difficult times as well as have something that something or someone that you can cling to or just remember your reason why you came here. That's very important. I love that. And that's a wrap. Nico, thank you so much for joining us today, wrapping this up. Uh, again, if anyone wants to connect with Nico, check the show notes below. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in the next episode. Nico, thanks again for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, man. Bye.